thank you, Amyloidosis Speakers Bureau, for having me. Today, I will be talking to you about AL amyloidosis, the symptoms, the diagnostics, and the challenges that come with the diagnosis. These are my conflicts of interest. As we know that, you know, typically AL amyloidosis is a very rare disease. There's about 4,000 cases per year, and it's due to the deposition of the light chains, whether it's kappa or lambda, that form insoluble proteins that can then go on and deposit into the tissues and cause organ damage. This takes a lot of time to happen. It does not happen overnight. And, you know, what all of you may learn in medical school is that Congo red stain is, when it's positive, it shows consistent with amyloidosis. However, um, I just want to take a step back and remind you all that there's 32 different proteins that have been described in the literature as uh, that can possibly cause amyloidosis. So amyloidosis in general is a broad term. You have to then define the subtype of amyloidosis. In this image, you can see on one hand, we are talking about the light chain, AL amyloidosis. On the other side, you have the trans protein that misfolds and forms amyloid fibrils, which then go on and, and cause organ uh, damage. And this is sort of alluding to the same thing, the type of amyloidosis and subtypes that have been described. The focus of our conversation today is going to be primary the AL amyloidosis. It is important to know that amyloidosis is a disease of delayed diagnosis, and that has a significant impact on survival and outcomes in general. That is why you have for Amyloidosis Speakers Bureau, organizations such as this, which want to raise awareness and increase awareness and, um, and ability to diagnose patients earlier. Um, you can see from this graph, uh, the percentage of patients who were diagnosed with symptoms onset less than six months to, uh, uh, to even more than two years. It's often the story in my clinic that I get patients too late in their disease uh, uh, symptom uh, by the time their symptoms set on. So um, this is a survey of 533 participants, 72% had AL amyloidosis, and diagnosis was not established until more than one year after onset of symptoms in 37% of patients. And late diagnosis accounts for high proportion, almost 25% of subjects who present with advanced irreversible cardiac damage and die within 12 months of diagnosis. So there's a lot of emphasis on that. That's very important. And that's why improving awareness is very crucial um, to us uh, diagnosing patients earlier and improving outcomes. Um, the patterns of organ involvement, um, we call the uh, AL amyloidosis or amyloidosis in general, the great masquerader, because it's not, it's very heterogeneous as to how patients present. Um, you can have, you know, just cardiac involvement, just renal involvement, you can have combined organ involvement, um, nerve involvement. So uh, it is very heterogeneous in how patients present. And that's, that's, that is something that I want everyone to take away from that. Um, just because uh, everyone's going to be sort of in tune and learning about one way of presentation doesn't mean the patient can, can't manifest, uh, the disease can't manifest in other ways. So it's good to be aware. And you can see from these graphs that there's um, the number of organs involved. Only 35, 34% of the times it's only one organ involved. 41% of the time it's two. 21% of the time it's three. And um, about 4% four, 4 is about four or more. And this sort of, uh, where I'm going to go into the step-by-step -step of this image on the signs and symptoms of amyloidosis and the diagnosis and then the typing and then eventually the treatment. The great masquerader because the amyloid fibrils uh, uh, can sort of deposit into any organ. So you can have deposition into the tongue. People can get macroglossia. Symptoms can range from, I, I feel like I'm biting the side of my tongue. That's becoming more frequent. My tongue, tongue is getting bigger. In fact, that's the presenting symptom of a patient I saw this week. And this can get, this can progress and uh, patients can even have, um, you know, the, the tongue can obstruct the airway as well. So it depends on how large it gets and when the patient gets diagnosis. There's, you know, uh, liver dysfunction and liver failure, cirrhosis uh, due to involvement of the liver. Uh, kidney failure can give you albuminuria, so mostly proteinuria. And patients also describe their urine as foamy. Um, and uh, sometimes I feel like patients with kidney failure kind of get uh, uh not, not kidney failure, but when they have they have abnormalities in their kidney function or they have proteinuria, um, they kind of get uh, uh, brushed away partially because, you know, the common causes of proteinuria such as diabetes and hypertension are too common. And automatically you look at a patient, you look at their body habits, and that assumption is made that this is 
due to uh, just hypertension and uh, or or uh, diabetes. But it is you have to be aware of um, other causes as well, and that leads to peripheral edema. You have cardiovascular involvement. There's restrictive cardiomyopathy, and on an MRI, cardiac MRI, you have late gadolinium enhancement. Your ventricle is very big and thick, and so it's stiff, doesn't pump as well. So the manifestations of that uh, and kidney failure is that you can get a retention of fluid, which leads to peripheral edema. Um, there's nerve involvement, autonomic dysfunction, so people can get hypotension, blood pressure tanks. I've had patients who presented so late that they cannot even sit up. Um, I've uh, done evaluations with them laying flat in my um, in my in my office, uh, as well as and in, in cl classically, everybody knows about the car carpal tunnel syndrome uh, involvement due to the compressed median nerve. These are several different ways in the, the the disease manifestations, and you can see each patient can can go. Some go to the primary care, some go to a kidney doctor. So the presentation is very very variable. So it's important for us to be all aware to be aware of this, so we can make a timely diagnosis. I want you all to pay attention to the timely diagnosis aspects of this, and then we'll sort of go into the basic workup for AL amyloidosis. The basics are that you get a serum protein electrophoresis in immunofixation. Again, the serum protein electrophoresis tells you the amount of abnormal light chain protein, but the immunofixation tells you the type of it. And nowadays there's a new test, which is even more sensitive. And that's the monoclonal protein studies uh, serum, which is basically a mass spec method of evaluating the monoclonal protein. You, uh, a 24 hour urine protein uh, electrophoresis or a 24 hour total protein is essential to quantify the amount of protein that's uh, being spilled out in the urine essentially. Uh, immunoglobulins, IgA, IgG, IgM standard. Um, just want to make sure, uh, remind everyone that the monoclonal protein study, which is a send out lab, that technically nowadays contains the IgA, IgG, IgM. Um, so I sort of, I'm doing more and more of that study versus the SPEP uh, nowadays, but many places may not have access. So SPEP slash immunofixation is the go-to. You have to do the serum free light chain, which is Kappa, um, free light chain and lambda free light chain. And, uh, you know, many times when I see patients, only part of this workup is done. It is imperative that all of this workup is done. You do the SPEP and immunofixation, you get the 24 hour urine, immunoglobulins, and the serum free light chains. And obviously, the complete metabolic panel to assess for kidney function, to assess for albumin. Patients with AL amyloidosis also have, they have a bleeding uh, a propensity to bleed, and that's partially due to factor 10 deficiency. So factor 10 is something I get often in my patients. You know, if you suspect liver involvement, alpha's and LF2s, and then if you suspect cardiac involvement, NT4BNP and cardiac biomarkers. When I'm suspecting cardiac disease, I get echocardiogram uh, and EKG, as well as a cardiac, M cardiac MRI. Um, if a diagnosis has not been made, um, I often I consult with my friendly cardiologist, which uh, which is so who is so instrumental in actually helping me take care of uh, the very sick cardiac amyloid patients I end up seeing. And um, you know sometimes we will omit the cardiac MRI if we have a very very high suspicion and we don't want to delay and we want to go straight to endomyocardial biopsy. But that's often a very nuanced discussion that we have amongst ourselves. And then obviously you can do all this testing, but the gold standard is tissue biopsy. Tissue is the issue. Tissue you must get. So you can do an abdominal fat pad biopsy or a bone marrow biopsy. Between that, 85% chances of getting a diagnosis. But I will. I have some comments about the fat pad biopsy. And then you can do the salivary gland biopsy. If they have GI involvement, biopsy the GI tract. And if you have any, um, kidney, heart, liver, any of those uh, organs that you suspect are involved um, they can get biopsy. It just depends on how quick can you get a biopsy and who's going to be the most amenable, you know, um, to, to getting a, a biopsy. So, you know, fat pad is relatively easy to do. It should actually be the go-to uh, uh, test. However, fat pad, and, and it's also non-invasive, right? So it's like appealing to the doctor as well as the patient. However, fat pad is very operator dependent in my opinion. So the centers that have a high volume and are so used to doing a lot of fat pads and have a good diagnostic yield, they know their fat pads are going to be positive. But oftentimes, 
in my experience, and now this is my bias and my 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 personal input here, that I don't get, I have not had uh, fat pads that have been positive. So while I'll do them um, in select cases, because like I said, the patient prefers it because it, they're easy to do, it's non-invasive. But if it's a negative biopsy, if it's a negative fat pad, and I have a very high suspicion that there is amyloidosis, AL amyloidosis in general, I will go and consult with my cardiologist, nephrologist, and discuss uh, with having a tissue, the tissue that's involved, a biopsy of that. Um, so I don't stop if my suspicion is very uh, uh, if my suspicion is very high, and the fat pad is negative or the bone marrow is negative. I do not stop. I listen to my clinical hunch, and I, I and I do end up getting the biopsy that I need. And once you get the biopsy, you do Congo red staining. That's positive for amyloidosis. But so the Congo red stain tells you that there is amyloidosis, but it does not tell you what type of amyloidosis, and that is actually very very important to know because we need to know what kind of amyloidosis it is. So that's where the Mayo mass spec test comes in. It tell, it identifies a type of amyloid. Um, often the tissue block has to be sent to Mayo and within seven to 10 days, depending on, I would say 10 days is reasonable, you, you can get the, uh, the mass spec results. And, um, and, and I think, you know, alluding back, not all centers have the necessary tools or clinical experts to diagnose this disease. And that's why, you know, I, I tell my, you know, my, the docs who refer to me, don't be afraid to reach out to the experts in your state or across the country. And you have wonderful resources such as, you know, the Amyloidosis Speakers Bureau, you have Amyloidosis Foundation and not, a lot of other tools uh, where you can find uh, usually one or two experts within your state um, that know how to manage these diseases. And there's a lot of increased awareness about it as well. So, uh, so I think don't be afraid to reach out um, if uh, you suspect it um, uh, to, to, so the patient can be timely, can have a timely diagnosis. And um, I want to highlight why the mass spec is so vital. Uh, this, is my per this is a case I, I dealt with with my first year uh, attending hood. I had an 80-year-old African-American patient who had lambda light chain MGUS. 5% um, uh, uh, plasma cells in the bone marrow, and but there was it was Congo red negative, and the patient had sort of symptoms of early onset of uh, of cardiac involvement and also had neuropathy. And you know the automatic thing is oh she has lambda light chain MGUS, and their symptoms are alluding to or su suggesting of amyloidosis that it is AL amyloidosis. And let me not pursue the proper diagnostic workup that has to be done. That's actually wrong. So in this case, we did, you know, we did all the necessary testing, the blood work, the the echo, the cardiac MRI, and ultimately my 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 cardiology colleague and I discussed about having an endomyocardial biopsy. So and guess what? The pathology was consistent with ATTR. Had we assumed based on her MGUS that she had AL amyloidosis, we would have given her the wrong treatment. So that's why the mass spec is vital for accurate diagnosis and management for the patient. And finally, just a few minutes on this, the goal of treatment is to decrease the production of the underlying monoclonal protein in AL amyloidosis. And, um, and that you do by giving plasma cell-directed therapies, which I will go briefly in a second. And then over time, there is the absorption of the already deposited fibrils, so patients can have an organ response. Our goal is that there should be rapid, deep, and sustained responses in terms of decreasing the light chain. However, um, I often educate patients that organ response varies and lags. It can take anywhere six months to a year to actually see some si sort of organ response. Most recently, Dara D has become, Dara Tumumab is a monoclonal antibody, cytoxin, bortezomib is velcate, and dexamethasone is the first combination that we use for AL amyloidosis up front. And typically stem cell transplant uh, was the go-to regimen, but not all patients are stem cell transplant eligible and there's a high mortality rate. So, but there's ongoing clinical trials that are truly assessing if there's uh, the, the utility of doing uh, uh, upfront stem cell transplant in, uh, in AL amyloidosis. And there's many other clinical trials that are going on. 
And this sort of highlights, we borrowed the treatments for ALM reduces have been borrowed for myeloma, but not all of those patient treatments can be used safely in patients with the ALM reduces. So the monoclonal antibodies, the daratumumab, the isatuximab, um, are commonly, you know, particularly Dara because that has an FDA approval, Bartizumab, um, dexamethasone, and then obviously stem cell transplant. Some of the oral drugs are hard to do because patients have difficulty with toler tolerability. And then this is the, these are the newest kids on the block. And they're giving us a lot, a lot of hope based on the clinical trials that are going on right now. So typically I said, the goal of, the goal of my uh, amyloidosis treatment is to decrease the, the light chain production. But the next goal is to actually help whatever the, the, wherever the light chains have deposited, the amyloid fibrils have deposited, we want them to be absorbed so the organ can actually you know, respond and recover. And so now there are um, two antibodies, uh, such as um, the KL-101 and Silomimab um, and uh, Britimimab. Uh, these are in clinical trials that are actually addressing this question. And the results of these are out to be uh, seen. I'm highlighting this. I know my focus, and these are the clinical trials, I know my focus is diagnostics, but I want to show that there's a lot of hope. We have really good and effective treatments. Timely diagnosis is key um, before, um, uh, you know, more organ damage has happened. So, you know, what I want you to walk away from this is that the amyloidosis is a great masquerader. Symptoms vary depending on the organ that is involved. There is not one pathway that the patient goes through, like a PCP cardiologist, hematologist. They can go to multiple doctors, depending on what their symptoms are. And, and that leads to often delays in their diagnosis and their outcomes ultimately, ultimately suffer. So early diagnosis is key. And I want you to take away, take, you know, that's my takeaway message. Early diagnosis is key to good outcomes and improve survivals. And don't dismiss the patient when you can't figure it out. If the dots don't connect and you don't have an answer and there are symptoms that are multiple, then keep searching and reach out to people who actually know the disease and who can help put it together. And I want you to, the final thing is, this disease is not so rare. It is likely that it's just underdiagnosed. So we want to spread this message. So we empower you with the tools and the diagnostic uh, knowledge um, so amyloidosis can be diagnosed in a timely manner. On that note, thank you so much. And that's it.